Nothing on the Bonnell Foundation's Living with Cystic Fibrosis podcast should be considered medical advice. Medical advice can only come from your CF physician. Cystic fibrosis can be a devastating diagnosis, but living with the disease can bring positivity and a new appreciation for each day. From the Bonnell Foundation in Detroit, Michigan, it's the Living with Cystic Fibrosis podcast, sponsored by Vertex Pharmaceutical. Here's your host, Laura Bonnell. Kim Bowman and her husband, Brian, are two of the strongest people I know. Kim and I have been friends for a long time. We both had two children with cystic fibrosis. She had two boys, Blake and Brett, and I have Molly and Emily. Blake only made it till his 14th birthday. He died from cystic fibrosis in January of 2015. It's every parent's nightmare, whether your child has cystic fibrosis or not, that your child should precede you in death. And seeing her life happen in this way was painfully hard for me to watch because we had multiple children with CF. I don't know how Kim got out of bed after Blake died, but she did. Not long after, four years later, Brett needed a double lung transplant. How terrified Kim and Brian must have been. They now had to deal with the possibility that their only living son could now die from a transplant. Fortunately, he didn't, but it wasn't smooth sailing. Brett came out of the transplant with beautiful new lungs, but lost his eyesight. There was no time for Kim and Brian to rest emotionally. They kept going. Today, Brett is rising up from the cruelty of this disease. He just got his new leader dog, and so his new chapter begins. In the beginning of this podcast, you'll hear his new dog chewing on a bone. And although everyone can't see you, it's so great to see you and to see the Christmas tree that is celebrating Blake. Um, so wonderful, my dear friend, Kim it's Bowman good to see you. and Brett. Yes. Good to see you too. Yeah, yeah. It's wonderful. So, Brett, this is your next phase, yeah. your exciting phase. So, tell us. You know, it's been such a long journey for you, but I I first want to talk about legacy, about your new leader dog. Um, So please tell us how this came about and the process of getting your dog. Yeah, yes. I've been, this journey's probably been about two years, probably a couple months after I actually went blind. I heard in the hospital about getting a guide dog, and they said that's going to be like the biggest thing. And so after I got weight gain certified, um, that was the thing I started working on is I was like, I think this dog will be huge for me. And I'm going to college and I work and I was like, you know, it's going to help me, you know, get around a lot quicker than when it came. And, um, it does, it totally does. Um, so I started moving, you know, um, uh, there's a organization around here called leader dog for the blind and, um, they do guide dogs. So I started, um, you have to fill out a whole thing and they come and check your house out and then, They'll have you come in for O&M and see, you know, how are your cane skills? And then you'll get put on a list once they think that you're ready for a guide dog. And then it's just a wait list till they can get you ready. And then you come in and you go for about three weeks and then they pick you a dog out based off of, you know, what your needs are. You know, are you a person that goes, goes, goes? Are you a person that, you know, maybe doesn't go a lot? I'm a person that go, go, go. So I got legacy. And um, he is the best dog in the world. In the world. Um, so actually, I have a story. So um, when I was actually there training, um, I almost got hit by um, a car. It was a FedEx truck, unfortunately. Oh, my goodness. The guy couldn't see me. So it wasn't his fault at all. But, you know, on any kind of uh, truck, you know, they don't have like, um, it's, it's harder to see someone in behind. And we were walking behind them. Almost like a blind and, spot, right? Yeah, yep, in driving. Rochester. Yeah. And... Um, the car started backing up. It was in an alleyway and we, he started backing up kind of quick and um, legacy seen that picked up on it right away and um, started barking, barking and then pushing me backwards, which I know that that means that, you know, he's getting me out of the way. And uh, yeah, he saved my life and training. And then right there, I was like, wow, like this dog, he really knows what he's doing. So we just built our trust up and, you know, I, I feel like every time I go out there, I have more trust in him and more trust in him. And so, I've probably done a hundred routes of them already, but we do different routes every day. You know, some are indoor, some are outdoors. It's amazing what he can do. So I just came home with him because we went through the whole training phase. It was, like I said, three weeks. Um, And this is day number three, 
Cole. Oh, yes. Wow. And he is such an amazing dog. You know, he's super good with little kids, super good with other animals. You know, I mean, I don't know if there is a better dog for me. So, yeah, he is amazing. He um, is a 20,000th guide dog that Leader Dog has done. So he's a little superstar himself. So it's funny. <laughs> so, yeah. And we can hear him playing down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. What breed is he? He is a hybrid. So he's um, a hybrid lab and um, golden retriever. He's a yellow lab hybrid golden retriever. He looks so, if you looked at him, he looks like a lab more, but he has a retriever color and face. And face. Yeah. His paws look like a lab too. They kind of, he has bigger paws. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Kim, what has this done for you as you watch Brett? continue on what do you see like your before and after legacy i know it's only been three days but uh, i think you know it's funny because brett and i were actually just talking about this yesterday and i said like just watching him i mean i know for you for you with the girls you know being more independent you had to go through that adapting period for me, this is the first time Brett's ever been away from home for three weeks. So that was for me a transition. But watching him come back home has been huge. Because I think even for Brett, he had to really take those three weeks and really grow himself and learn to lean in on himself a little bit more for things. Things that I knew he was capable of doing, but he just stepped in. And now watching him come home with Legacy, he's definitely like more independent oh that's his bone <laughs> <laughs> he's having a good time at your feet oh yeah he um, he's more independent and legacy definitely helps create that sense of independence for him he really helps like his everyday flow just move easier for him you know he's taken these last two years with loss of sight and he's evolved as a person he's had an opportunity to get a, like a better handle on, yeah. you know, what this is going to be like and him get comfortable with it before he got legacy. And now having legacy is just like the full circle. But me as a mom watching it, it's beautiful to watch it unfold. And I would think that it gives you more just maybe emotional freedom or I mean, because you still, of course, are worrying. Oh, yeah. But tell me, does it make you feel like, you know, Brett can be more independent? Oh, yeah. I would definitely say that. Because even like um, when he says, I want to walk, he's got a favorite like Coney Island that he loves to go to. That's right out of our subdivision. And I, I worry, like, I mean, I know that his cane skills are good, but it's nerve wracking because you've got all this heavy traffic on a main road too. And with legacy, like if he says, mom, Hey, I'm, I'm going to go do a long walk or, you know, mom, I need to navigate at school or mom, I'm going to navigate with work or, you know, wherever it is that he needs it. I mean, with the cane, yes, but you still have those drivers out there that I, I worry about. You've got electric cars that are quiet um, that don't, he wouldn't necessarily maybe even, you know, here coming up on him, where legacy are those eyes. So for me, I breathe a little bit easier knowing that he's got those eyes that are with him that are going to protect him. And especially after that little episode, when he was training out in Rochester Hills with him, um, with that FedEx truck. I mean, for me, that was like, I cried when Brett told me because I thought, oh my gosh, you know, right. His instincts kicked in, you know, I mean, you don't want for that situation to present. But as a mom, like it makes my heart smile knowing that this dog, all the training has been not for nothing. He's going to do his job and protect him. And there is nothing else we want as moms, right? I mean, yeah. oh. let the tears flow. I totally get that. <laughs> Sorry, Brett. I yeah. know it's no, so it's okay. hard, yeah. but yep. you know, it's so hard for moms like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And our children and cystic fibrosis and everything that goes with it. And yeah. Brett, I wanted to ask you. Yeah. I mean, I've had dogs my entire life and, <laughs> you know, you, we love them like family. We do. But this bond, even three days in, this bond, because this dog is a part of you. Yeah. It must be something that we have no idea about. 
Yeah, because I've had dogs too. Um, and you, like you said, they are family members. And, you know, he is definitely a family member already. But I think of him too, you know, as a brother. You know, he's my younger brother, but he's going to go with me out. And when we do things and he looks after me, you know, and things that I, you know, because I can hear really good out there. But there's some things that, you know, you just need sight, you know, and he has that sight. So there's things that are in the air that I can't see that we're going to walk up on. And he'll pick up on that, you know. There's things that we're going to walk up on, like cars that maybe are parked uh, over the sidewalk and he's going to just navigate around them. And so things that would still be harder for me, you know, even with hearing, you know, he just does it and he does it with ease. It makes it easier, you know, because the more ease you have with things and you're like, wow, he did that really easy. The more you're going to want to be able to try to even attempt to do so. So is he ever off the job? I mean, obviously now he's chewing on a bone because right. you're sitting down. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but how does that work? Yeah, so um, he has a harness he wears when he's working. So he knows when he's working and when he's not working. So like right now, he does not have the harness on. He's just a regular dog right now. You know, he's hanging out, you know, he'll play chew his bones. Um, now, when he has his harness on, he will not chew his bones. He will be just sitting right next to me and waiting for, you know, what he needs to do to help me. He'll even help me put his harness on. I'll say head in and hold it and he'll stick his head in and he'll uh, help me get it on. And then I'll snap it under his stomach and he's ready to go. And he, he literally loves putting, when you say, you know, all right, we're going to go to work. He loves that. His tail starts going and, you know, he loves to work. It's crazy, but he loves it. And I love it because it, and able to do more things more efficiently too, you know, you know, that Coney Island that I like to go to with a cane, you know, it might take me 45 minutes um, with legacy. It might take me like nine minutes. Really? So it's a lot quicker route. Yeah. Cause we walk really, really quick and efficiently and the confidence is and the like confidence through the roof. Too, yeah. Yeah. Objects that <clears throat> would kind of make me have to stop and think for a couple of minutes about how am I going to get around them? He just will navigate around them. So yeah. Wow, that is wonderful. So would you say so far in this short period of time, is it the walks that you take kind of the most remarkable right now? Yep, definitely. And, you know, too, I would say, you know, because of Christmas is really close. Um, we've been going indoor malls and that's, you know, where lots of people are, little kids, you know, there's all these different, you know, there's you other Somerset collection last week, right? Yep. And, there's, and he did really good. Um, there's other service dogs out there for different, you know, means, you know, to be a service dog, you can have someone for sight, some for there's other, you know, diseases that need it. There's a lot of different reasons why, but he does great with all that. And when he's working, that's when he is focused and he's like in game mode and he's going to do whatever it takes to get to the finish line to get me there. So yeah, he loves it. So you're remarkable. Everything you've been through, you've lost a brother to cystic fibrosis. Then four years later, you had a transplant. You lost your sight because of it. You're in a pandemic. Yeah, and sure. now, yeah. you know, <laughs> you know, you've got this dog. And I just think you're amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. It is. I mean, I bow to you, honestly, and your mother. Like, you are exceptional. I know it's a roller coaster, but how do you get through it? How in the darkest time? Right. And there, I'm sure there has to have been more than one. How do you go forward um, with everything? You know, everyone, like I said, has tough days and I have tough days myself and I'll be the first one to say that. <laughs> but um, when I get tough days, the biggest thing that I always look at is keep saying that, you know, it's going to get better. Of course. You know what I mean? Everyone has tough days, no matter who you are. And, you know, I always honestly go back to my brother. What would he be saying to me? And, you know, I always try to say, you know, you just got to keep pushing. You got to keep pushing because it's going to get better. You know what I mean? It doesn't stay dark forever it's just like when you're going through a tunnel you know it might be dark for a while but then you'll see the sun so that's what I always try to go for and that is so beautiful and one other thing tell me about your eyes yeah they look real 
and beautiful. Thank you so much. And, yeah. you know, I, I think it's it's a wonderful thing that if you're blind, you don't necessarily, you don't have to look blind. No, I get what you're saying. hundred percent. Yeah. You don't have to stick out. Right. I think that's huge. And again, t- medical technology has come a long ways, even in prosthetics. So I have prosthetic eyes in both, they call it. So uh, it's usually super rare that you need both, but um, I did need both, unfortunately. And so I had it all done at University of Michigan. The doctor is the best. He's world renowned. There's people that fly in from all over the world to have him make eyes for them. Say his name because people might want to know. Dr. Greg Dutz. And he is the best. His personality is the best. And he is one of a kind. Because a lot of um, the way they make prosthetics nowadays um, with technology is with a laser. And I think he's the only person in the country that hand, he does it by hand. Wow. He still so, believes in doing old yeah. school. <laughs> but it, it actually lasts yeah. longer, the color and everything. Um, yeah, I've had really like good double luck. the life of the eye, isn't it, with the yeah, color? Yeah, it lasts a lot longer. Yeah. Um, How long does it last, usually? So it depends on if you're young or if you're older. Like someone in me that's, you know, you got an adult head and you're not probably going to grow as much with your face face itself. But once you have your eyes taken out with this surgery, um, both ocular cavities are different sizes. So as there's no eye there moving, muscles get weaker. So the size of your ocular cavity is going to get bigger. So then they have to account for that over time. Um, So usually probably the first set you get is probably eight years. Let's, you know, give or take. Okay. So, yeah. And then if you're younger, say you're, you know, between, I don't know, five and 14 or 15, you know, you might get a less, probably like five or six years because they're going to have to keep changing and changing them. So, but yeah, and they do amazing stuff there. So it's, yeah, I've never had anybody say, anything about how they look fake or you know no. I, i've always just fit in and yeah. no one's ever said that so everyone's honestly ever <laughs> said wow you have beautiful eyes that's all i've ever had so yeah i would think that people mistake you for being sighted yes they do they do yeah i actually <laughs> get work. that yeah at work <laughs> I, I have that all the time i work at target and um Go i'm a guest advocate <laughs> and um I walk around too, and sometimes I set my cane down so people don't realize I'm blind, and they'll ask me, hey, you know, can you grab this or this? And I always try, but sometimes it doesn't work out. But yeah, people really honestly don't. And I usually push carts too up front and like sanitize them, and people never think I'm blind. Never. I don't think I've ever had anybody think that I was blind. Yeah. Wow. So, and now will Legacy be with you at work and school? Yeah. So he'll be everywhere I go, he'll go with me. So. Because it pushes him too and it makes him better at helping me. And we'll do it more efficiently and safer, of course, too. Definitely. So, yep. And Kim, what do you want to add about how you and your husband, Brian, see Brett, like, getting back to his more normal life? You know, I would, while Brett was gone, Brian and I actually, this was something we were sitting one night and I said, you know, just watching him, uh, you know, unfold these last years, you know, watching him travel through the loss of Lake was hard. I think for all of us, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. That was the hardest thing. And watching him travel through this and then get to the point where his lungs were so sick that he needed lungs prepared, you know, mentally, physically for that. I mean, he knows he's got a world of support, right? Mm -hmm. But like, as a young man, these were things that, you know, he ultimately decisions he had to make. And he knew that he could lean in on me and Brian, but then, you know, then lungs. Yeah, yeah. And then loss of sight. Right, right. Then making the decision. Listen, like, I remember coming in one day and I said to him, I said, I'm so sad about this whole thing with your eyes. And he says, mom. He's like, I know. He says, but at the end of the day, somebody gave me yep, yeah. the ultimate <clears throat> gift of life. Oh, yeah. yeah. And he said, I'm not going to waste a minute of this. And I just thought to myself, like, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. I cannot be a more prouder mom to, like, watch this kid who is journeying through 
some of the most challenging moments that not only just a human can travel through, but a cf -er have to travel through. You know, these are major, major moments in not only a CF family's world, but a cf -er's world. And for him to sit there and tell me, like, in other words, mom, we got this. And um, to just watch him just with confidence say, you know, I know I don't, I've got to do this three week thing to, to get my dog, um, to watch him come home. And he's ready now, like he's ready to like, what's next, mom? You know, school, a uh, job, you know, what does the future hold for me? And as a mom with a cf -er, these are the things that you think about, right? Mm -hmm. And all you want is absolutely the best. You want them to just love life. You want them to be happy. And whatever that looks like for them, for them to be happy. Um, I'm so proud of them. And Brett, tell me why you're getting choked up. I obviously. Uh, it's just I can, I, I, don't, um, I can remember, you know, going through those, um, those moments and, you know, those thoughts and all those emotions that came with it. And yeah, I can remember when that all happened and, you know, the doctors came to me after this was like two weeks post double lung transplant and nothing was working, you know, to try to save my eyes. So, and they said that, you know, you're going to go blind. And then, you know, it kind of hit me and, you know, I was like, wow, like that's really going to happen. And um, Because when you came out of the transplant, Yep. Did you notice, like, tell us briefly, you know, walk us through what happened. So uh, after I had my double lung transplant, it all went really successful. I came out of it really quick um, after uh, anesthesia. You were like ahead um, of schedule. I was uh, extubated probably a day, <laughs> a day after, which is really quick. 24 hours, yeah. literally. <laughs> and then um, I could see right away. I had no vision problems. But the reason why I could is because I was on high doses of antibiotics and steroids, which suppressed all of the, the stuff that already went to the eyes by then. So I wasn't going to see anything until they started lowering the dose of antibiotics to switch me to orals to go home with. So that's when I started noticing that my eyes started swelling up and it looked like pink eye, but it was not pink eye. And it was a pseudomonas that most people with CF have in their lungs and um, stay in their lungs until they ultimately get a transplant. You know, it's, it's something that usually my transplant doctor told me that, you know, forces you to get a transplant because, you know, it lives with you your whole life and, you know, usually doesn't act up, but you know, when you get these flares that you have to go into the hospital with, that's what flares it up. It adds to the CF and then it'll ultimately, when they looked at me to evaluate me for transplant, they said, you know, you probably got, you know, a year. So, and they said, you know, we, it's usually about an eight month wait. So they said, you know, this is going to be, it's going to be perfect. And it ultimately got a lot worse, a lot quicker than they thought. So I got lungs in a month because of how quick it got worse. Um, thank God I got lungs, you know, that quick. Ultimate gift of life. Yeah. And I tell people this all the day because, mm -hmm. you know, it did, it was rough, you know, going through all these things, but I would do it a hundred times again because it's, it's worth it. And look where you are yeah exactly it's next amazing chapter yeah just amazing so tell us where you're going to college and what you're um trying to get your degree in oh. yes yeah so <laughs> right now i'm going to dorsey college and mm -hmm. i'm going for my general massage therapy there and then i will be switching to go to schoolcraft college to get my uh, degree in associates in science and sports massage therapy fantastic how's it going so far it is going really good. Um, there is actually someone. It's funny because I, you know, I since before I went blind, I didn't know anybody blind. I didn't have anybody that went to school that was blind. I didn't even know anybody around me that was blind. So it was like, you know, I had no one to lean on. And then once I went blind, it was like all these people started popping up. I was like, wow, you're blind too. And then, so um, it, it's it's nice, you know, like you know when you have CF and you meet someone that has CF and, you know, it's tough with CF because you're not supposed to be around people with CF, but, you know, even they just talk to them over the phone or, you know, because you can lean on them, you know, maybe they've gone through something that you might go through, or it's the same thing with blindness, you know, different people like with CF, there's different circumstances, circumstances with CF and different people have gone through maybe more or less, but, you know, it's CF 
you know, it's blindness. It's, it's like, you're all on a team. Everyone's maybe, you know, going through more or less, but everyone's there for you. And if you need someone to ask you like, how was this, you know, when you went through this and, you know, and they'll tell you and they'll give you pointers. And that's what it's about is leaning on people that have gone through maybe what you're going to go through or maybe what you're not. But the more information you get on a situation, the better out I think it is because then you know in your head what is ahead or what maybe not is ahead. And that's always a thing I try to, you know, is lean on people. I think you're an inspiration and you're just changing the world. Thank you. I just think you're an incredible person and you've only just begun. You have only <laughs> just begun. Yeah, I'm so thankful. And this is another thing I want to share too, is I got to actually meet my donor family. Really? And which was like super emotional. And I got to meet, you know, who my donor was and what kind of a person he was. And it, you know, it changed, it changed my life. Yeah. So tell us about your donor. Are we, we're just all going <laughs> to cry here. This is, I mean, so. what a gift. It was a gift because that's, you know. We would say during um, pandemic when the world shut down, that's yeah, when we that's actually when got happened. to be. Yeah. So we met over <laughs> FaceTime first, you know, just to see. And at that time, they didn't know I went blind, you know, because like, again, you know, it's hard to know I'm blind because usually I'll look at the camera. I'll look at, you know, the FaceTime that where the camera spot is and it's hard to pick it out. I didn't tell them right away because I didn't want them to feel guilty that, you know, maybe it was something that my donor's name was Art. Mm -hmm. Arthur and I didn't want them to feel like it was something that you know ours was lungs did because it was not it, it was my own lungs and so when I met them in person that's when I did that and uh, I got to meet them in person we made we did a road trip in the summertime uh what was it last year yeah last summer, yeah, last summer. Yeah. um and he has three daughters and you know all their husbands and kids and um Michelle Art's wife like a second came out there and they're a second family. like they literally um michelle talks to me we call each other so much and <laughs> she wants to know every time i go get um P pfts and every time i see transplant and they want to know how you know what's going on how are your lungs and you know Aww. how are you doing what's going on with school and you know and i'm always updating them and you know knowing what's going on with them and it's like a second family and i and uh, mm -hmm. and it's amazing and it's funny because they were actually art was from Rochester, where a leader dog is, and his best friend is, was a guide dog trainer. Oh my gosh! No coincidences, right? Right, right. No, no coincidence. Yeah. No, how life coincidence. comes full circle. So really, um, truly. they knew one of the trainers that was there, and his name was Greg, and he actually moved to another guide dog school, and then he's already retired. But it's crazy how the world goes around, and maybe people right now you haven't linked up with that you will eventually, and. So, yeah, so in art, you know, was just a great guy. Him and his wife both worked for GM and um, they actually both retired a couple of years before this happened. Um, and they were heading to the beach one day um, with their grandkids just for, you know, an, an uh, afternoon out. An unfortunate event happened, um, yeah. a car accident. And uh, that's how I got lungs. And it's, it's crazy to think about, you know what I mean? It, it really is. And, and I was laying in the hospital before this even happened. And I was thinking about like, how am I going to get lungs? Cause you know, you know, to get lungs or to get, you know, a heart, mm -hmm. you know, those two organs, you know, you can't get a live donor, you know? So something crazy has to happen to someone for you to stay alive. And it's hard to think about, but the way I tried to think about it is that no matter what, was going to happen, whether you needed lungs, whether you didn't, something crazy was going to happen to that person that is out of your control. So that's what that's, a beautiful yeah. way to pay it forward and, and yeah, and continue a life. I mean, yeah, it's kind of magical. You know, I mean, it's very sad for your donor family, of course, tragic, but it's tragic. It and is. when we met Michelle and her family, the one thing that she made sure that she wanted Brett to know was that her and Art had always wanted to be donors. Yeah, that was his goal. That wasn't like so, something they just threw so up they knew uh, that. They threw on. Yeah. yeah. So he um, always wanted to be a donor. And um, they actually got to find out the day that the doctor came in. And it was August 6th that, you know, he was medevaced from the site to um, a hospital. And um, they said that, you know, they couldn't do anymore. You know, he had bleeding on the brain that just they couldn't stop he had bleeding in the brain somewhere else and you know they just you know it was tough you know the decisions they had to make and i 
She didn't even imagine to be in their spot. But she knew that that was Arthur's, you know, her and Arthur herself, they wanted to donate. And so she asked the doctor if could he donate anything. And the doctor, you know, said that they were going to check and, you know, see what they can donate. And so they came back and said that his lungs and um, his liver could be donated. So then they already had matches waiting and I was a match for his lungs. And there was someone else that was a match for the liver. And um, they never found out who, who got the liver. They know it was like a 57 year old uh, man, but they knew that a 23 year old guy, uh, man got the lungs. And um, they told me that they were there the day that the helicopter landed from U of M. And he was the biggest U of M fan. Biggest. <laughs> wow. So, um, yeah. So when the U of M helicopter landed, she was like, wow, that, you know, maybe it's going to U of M. You know, and they didn't know at that time. And so, um, they got to do um, it's kind of surreal, yeah. They it? got to do a hall walk, which you know, I, if you have CF, you probably have seen that. You know, if you're going to get transplanted, because it's I always look at stuff up, you know, and it's kind of cool because everybody gets in the hallway and claps, and um, as the donor and the family, you know, as they push you to the OR and the they call it retrieval teams are there ready to um, take the organs, but it's you know. For, you know, people that donate, it's moment. a very special moment, but, you know, it's very sad. And, um, again, I can't thank um, Arthur and um, Arthur's family enough. So He's forever a part of Brett. <laughs> yeah, I take a breath from him and a breath from me. So, yeah, his lungs are literally keeping me alive right now mm-hmm. and keeping me healthy at tip-top shape. So it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. I say, I think I've seen... You know, well, Laura, you and I, I feel like we've like grown up at U of M with our kids. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, I think over the years, you know, from the time that our kids have been little, we've probably come in and out of there between clinic visits and hospital stays. We've seen that helicopter come in and out a million times. Right. Mm-hmm. But I have to tell you, it's a mom now who's had a kiddo that has received new lungs. Uh, I remember being out there the day that Brett's lungs were on their way back. And it was the most surreal experience. I remember being out there with my brother and my husband was in the hospital and he called my phone and he said, all right, Kimmy, he said, they said ETA, it's like like two minutes out. He said, it's, it's coming in. And I remember looking up and there comes this helicopter. And watching it land, and knowing that those lungs were going to breathe new life to my son, it was the most amazing experience ever. And then, so now, like every time we pull into the hospital or we were coming through the drive, and I see that copter, I literally like I just tear because I know, like. For me, like, I know what that represents. It just has such a profound, you know, symbol for me now that it just didn't have that same for me before. Um, I mean, I'm it's looking a at my kid, is, yeah. like, really just is. to look at Brett, it is just, he is a beautiful example of what gift of life does. It allows in our world, respectively, for a family who has a CFR that is at the point of needing new lungs or new organs, like looking at Brett and everything this kid has, every hurdle he has had to face, and yet he chooses life. He chooses to celebrate this amazing gift he was given, come, you know, the hurdles that came with it. He's like, okay, let's go. And he presses forward and he's like, okay, what's my next challenge? What am I doing next? You know, um, and just living life full. And um, for that as a mom, like I am so humbled because I, I say through Brett and Blake, I have learned so much about just appreciating this amazing life that we're given, this gift of life that we are given, oh, as, you know, as human beings, because they see it very differently. And they have taught me just be in the moment, appreciate each and every single second yeah, yeah. i mean it's true you're not i'm one very you're not very given proud mom. the next hour yes you're not so you just gotta live it up to the fullest you know take every shot make every moment yeah so yeah 
Yeah, an inspiration. And Kim, same to you. You know, we have walked the halls and sat and cried <laughs> together, you know, over our I kids. Yes. And, you know, it's just hard to put into words how you've touched me since I've met you. Just... <laughs> You're really, truly grace and beauty, both of you, all of you. And yeah. I just, you know, love you both so much. So love you. Yeah, we love you. thanks for sharing a small part of your story, because <laughs> this is a small part. Yeah, You've yeah. been through so much in your 25 years. And Kim, as a CF mom, you know, so much and losing a son. So yeah. this is just the beginning. We're going to talk more, but yep. thank you both so much Girl, for thank this. You. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. We love you. And we're going to post a picture of Legacy, too. Awesome. Oh, yes, we love that. Yeah, he's a, he's a cute little guy. So, yep. Thank you guys all. He is. Thank you. The original music in this podcast is performed by Kevin Allen. It's not complicated. Who happens to have cystic fibrosis. We all got our worries and fears. I know it's got you frustrated. But loving you is so all right. This has been the Living with Cystic Fibrosis podcast. For more information and to learn more about the Bonnell Foundation, check them out online at thebonnellfoundation.org. That's B-O-N-N-E-L-L foundation.org. This podcast was sponsored by Vertex Pharmaceutical, the science of possibility, and produced by Jagged Detroit Podcasts, 